Welcome back to How to Be Miserable, videos on psychology and self-care, some of them focused on how we may make our lives worse without meaning to. Subscribe to get notifications in your feed about new videos. Now in this series I've been presenting ways to get better sleep. This isn't a substitute for consultation with a healthcare professional and I'm not focused here on specific problems like sleep apnea or other difficulties. Do not rely on health information from some guy on YouTube. It's a supplement, it's not the whole thing. Okay, so I've covered in other videos some things not to do and some ways of making your bedroom serve you better. Now for some recommendations about what to do in order to improve your sleep. First, set a regular bedtime range. Jet lag has nothing to do with jets. It's produced mainly by changes in your sleep cycle timing. Most adults take three to four days to adapt to changes of even a few time zones. Imagine the jet lag that you'd experience if every Thursday you flew from Vancouver to Toronto or LA to New York and then back again every Sunday. Three time zones. Well, if you're going to bed at 10 p.m. on week weekdays and 1 a.m. on weekends, that's virtually the same thing. A lot of people's insomnia isn't really insomnia. It's jet lag, even though they haven't gone anywhere. To get your sleep on track, set a regular bedtime for yourself and keep to it. It's fine if it's a range within an hour or so, for example, between 10 and 11. It doesn't have to be 10.09, exactly. Now, does this mean that you can never go to a party or stay out late, you know, as long as you live? No. But if your sleep is really disrupted, this may be something you need to do for a while in order to get it back on track. And it may be something you need to be conscious of long term term, that there's this price for randomizing your bedtime. Second, have a regular rising time. Some research indicates that getting up at the same time each day has an even more potent effect on sleep stabilization than having a set bedtime. You do not have to be getting up at dawn, or even particularly early, but if you want to get your sleep on track, it needs to be stable, even on weekends. If your sleep disruption is having a major impact on your quality of life, it is worth the cost of doing this. And believe me, I know, it doesn't seem to make sense. You want more sleep. The alarm goes off and it wakes you up. And you know you could get back to sleep if you just hit the snooze button. And the way to get more sleep is to get out of bed. Doesn't seem right, but it is. Third, make sleep a priority. A lot of people treat sleep as this annoying detractor to their life. It eats time and the need for sleep is, well, it's just an inconvenience. So they treat it as the bottom of the priority list. I need to get the taxes done. I need to see the end of this movie. I need to finish the laundry. They think that once every other priority is settled, then they can go to bed, which means they will never develop a decent sleep-wake cycle. If this is important to you, if it's having a big impact on your life, then it needs to be a priority. The laundry isn't done? Well, it's time to go to bed, so the laundry... Tough luck. Sleep is important. In the immortal words of Jean-Luc Picard, make it so. Four. 
prepare for sleep. In the hour or so before your bedtime, do things that help you wind down and release the stresses of the day. Don't try to get everything done before you hit the bed. That will only cause you to lie there awake. Reading can help, meditation, quiet activity, even doing the dishes. Things that don't stress you out. You can even save things up like that for late in the evening and save the rest of the day for the challenging stuff. Five, use the night shift function. We evolved to wake up and become more alert as it gets lighter in our environment. Yet today, many of us spend the evening looking directly into light sources, the TV, the computer, the phone, and all light, it turns out, is not created equal. The light toward the blue end of the spectrum wakes us up more than light towards the reddish end. So one way of reducing this wake-up effect, obviously, is to reduce your screen use before bed. And I don't want to discard that. I think it's a good idea. But another strategy, in addition to that, is to have all your screens automatically change their tint a few hours before you go to bed. On Mac devices, this is called night shift. On Windows devices, it's called night light. Good chance your TV has it too. This is a good thing. Use it, but don't use it as a reason to keep staring at the computer even more than you already do. Six, have a bedtime ritual. Pavlov's dogs salivated when they heard the bell because they associated it with food coming soon. We want you to associate your bedroom and a whole set of behaviors with winding down and going to sleep. It's almost as though there's a hidden observer lodged in the back of your brain watching what you do and taking cues from that. Hey, he's having a real tea. He's putting the dishes away from the drying rack. He's brushing his teeth. Hmm, I know what that means. He's heading to bed and sleep. These rituals can actually be like the bell for those dogs, right? Except instead of getting hungry, you get sleepy. For the religious, saying prayers before bed probably helped function this way in addition to any theological significance it had. I encourage you to find things that you can make part of your personal wind-down ritual as you prepare for sleep. Seven, use the three things exercise. I've spoken about the three things exercise in another video as a way of enhancing gratitude and life satisfaction. It can also be helpful for some people to build into their bedtime ritual, especially if your natural tendency is to think back over the day and dwell on everything that went wrong or to think about tomorrow and all the stressful things you have to do. The idea, very simply, is to have a notebook and pen all set up somewhere in your home, though maybe not right by your bed, and just before bed, list three positive things about the day. Things you did, things that happened, anything at all. The bagel tasted good. Someone invited you to dinner. You finished your tax form. Anything. Then look at these things, and for each one, ask yourself gently, why'd that happen? Sometimes it'll be about you. I was tempted to avoid the tax form, but I sat down and I spent 10 minutes on it anyway. Good for me. But sometimes it has nothing to do with you. That deli seems to make great bagels. Whatever, it doesn't matter. The main point is to sit with these positive things for just a few moments and cultivate a sense of gratitude and appreciation for these small positive elements of your life. Eight, 10 belly breaths. 
When you get stressed out, your breathing tends to change. It gets faster and shallower, and you tend to breathe mostly up here in your chest. Your diaphragm doesn't work as much. One way to relax and calm yourself into sleep is to do belly breathing, which is really about activating your diaphragm. If you have asthma or any lung problems, do consult your physician before you do this. Place a hand on your stomach, breathe slowly in, feeling your stomach expand as you do. Then breathe out just as slowly. And let yourself pause for the same length of time after your exhalation. Then breathe in again. Count the breaths and do at least one set of 10, counting as you go. So each breath is one. This can help you release the tension in your body, but it also focuses your attention on the task and away from the stressful thoughts that you might be having otherwise. Nine, crowd worries out. If you're trying to get to sleep or you wake up in the middle of the night, what does your mind want to do? For a lot of people, the mind says, gosh, nothing going on. Let's think about all the stressful things in my life, the problems of the world, diseases I might have, terrible things that might happen, and stuff I need to do tomorrow. This is a really great idea. If your goal is to stay awake. It's a lousy idea if your goal is to go to sleep. So what do you do? Well, one idea is just uh, stop it. Stop thinking about that stuff. But that's like trying not to think of a pink elephant. The more you try to push these thoughts away, the stronger they get. Instead, have some specific topics in mind that you can push yourself to think about instead crowd out those worrying thoughts. Don't starve them out. You can't think about two things at once. So if you can engage yourself with that other topic, the worrying thoughts will decline. Now, maybe you can think of places in the world that you'd like to visit, or the names of all the characters in a show that you watched, or a fantasy of some kind. Anything that does not stress you out. Now, inevitably, those worrying thoughts will try to come back. Your job is to accept them and use them as a reminder to gently redirect your mind back to your other topic. Oh my gosh, what if my kid is on drugs? Uh-huh. And what was that character's name again on that show? Very gently, over and over. Don't just try not to think. That'll never work. 10. Put the alarm across the room. If you're a person who hears the alarm and reaches over to press the snooze button a bunch of times, you're not helping. Any sleep you get in that last 10 minutes is not going to be restorative. It won't help you feel any more rested during the day. It's a bad habit. To break yourself of it, put the alarm across the room so that you have to get up, stand upright, and go across the room in order to turn it off. Once you're standing, you're more likely to stay up. Do not have that snooze button in reach. Okay, so that's the third of three posts I've made on this topic, 30 tips in all. Is that it? Not at all. There are many more strategies than these, and there's a whole therapy protocol called Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Insomnia, or CBTI, that can help people overcome long-standing sleep difficulties. These tips are just the tip of the iceberg. But let's not downplay them. If you see a CBTI clinician, at least some of these tips are likely to be a part of the program. And putting these strategies into practice can go a very long way to helping a huge number of people get their sleep on track. In my experience, 
many people don't need much more than this. But of course, learning about these ideas does nothing. You actually have to put them into practice. And they don't work the first night or the third. You have to make it a commitment to improve the quality of your sleep. And if you do that, you'll probably find that you've improved the quality of your waking life as well. Thanks for watching. If you like videos like this, consider pressing subscribe.